Hello everyone. Uh, I'd like to show the sense of, uh, I uh, have the background of psychiatry and medical school and then I decided to shift to psychology for a very important reason is that I want to do more of prevention. I want to do like, I don't want children to get sick of specialized in children and families. So I, I always try to work with preschools and schools to try to do more, more uh, prevention. So even my topic today, I was so passionate about it, it's about schools and how to like, guide schools into mental well-being and mental health uh, as much as possible. If you think about it, this, this session is going to be more like um, touching your human lives. You're, you're going to think about your children. You're going to think uh, what happened to you in school. Um, so if you think about it, school is our life till the age of like college. We spend the whole day in school, interact with people, interact with teachers, and then we go home for a little period of time, interact with our parents, and then we sleep, and then it's our life. We get only little vacations, it's our life. So to improve our lives, we have to improve the, the, what's happening in schools. And internationally, it's just not uh, one country. Some lucky countries have improved the environments, but most countries do not. So first, when we're, when we're thinking like, what is mental well-being? Is it just to be free of mental illness or like, we should do like, no, we need to work on our wellness. It's not just to prevent mental uh, illness. We have to work on wellness. And with the pandemic, I don't know if you know, but there's another, there's another pandemic, which is a mental health pandemic. Okay, uh, it's a mental health pandemic. And if any clinician here is a psychiatrist or a psychologist, they're gonna tell you our clinics are completely full. We're overbooked. We can't cover the number of like uh, stressed children, families. And it's it's like an outcome of the pandemic. It just burst, you know. So we really have to give attention to the subject, and I hope that this like lights a, a, a small flame towards it, like improving schools, improving what's happening all around. So the child is, is, is like in the middle. Everything around is affecting the child the family, the, the, the learning environment, the community. This is a proposal from, from one of the studies, the references are later, on how to start doing the, the, the improvement. So we have to ask ourselves why we're proposing a certain uh, approach for mental well-being, what needs to be measured, who provides the information, it's just a model so that maybe um, a school can have the courage to follow, to, make, to have a real study of how to improve the children's well-being at the schools. So, and identifying the stress in children and um, adolescents is really a key. And to do that, we have to do several things that uh, we're going to talk about. First, I want to show you this. Um, study, it's done actually this year, they call it the second COVID anniversary, <laughs> okay. and they, these are the stresses that uh, parents expressed. This is in America, to, uh, 2022, uh, this study was done by the APA, American Psychological Association, and the parents expressed that this is what happened to the children, this is their opinion, that their opinion is significant, parents' opinion is significant. So 73% social life attraction. Can you imagine? 72% disruption of schedule. 71% the economic uh, development. 71% thought emotional health and development has a problem. So it's, the numbers are very scary. Um, and, and really, something needs to be done about it. And what's really frightening and it really touches my heart every time I see a toddler on an iPad or an iPhone. <laughs> I'm really, I really get affected. I try to speak to the parent even if, if they're a stranger at the mall or something, because I think it's like giving them a poison. 
um, the number of, and maybe the pediatricians here can also like testify, the number of delayed children um, between uh, being diagnosed with autism later or just being developmental delay is scary. And then they get the addiction problems with media and all of this stuff. And again, a, a big part of it happened with the pandemic because all the children did go to their streets and they stayed at home. They were put on their devices. And it's really like something, I think there's a speaker about this at the end of the day, so looking forward uh, for it. These are examples of things I'm seeing every day at the clinic, me personally. Uh, a lot of anxiety, separation anxiety, general social, depression, OCD, social skill problems. Again, children now are preferring to stay at home on their devices and they're not even going out with friends, even teenagers. Can you imagine? Um, of course, bullying or being bullied because of aggression or any struggles. Attention problems and even academic levels. Uh, behavioral problems, eating disorders are on the right, social media problems. I'm sorry I'm bringing all this news to you, but it's really, it's really like it needs action. So we all need to uh, like unite and join efforts and work towards like a better environment for our children at school. Um, maybe we can make a difference, hopefully we can make a difference. Um, this is the famous uh, Rothenbrenner chart, if you've studied psychology. And we used to say that the developing child, and then comes the family, the school, and, and then the micro system, uh, which is the interaction of micro systems and then the exosystem system, and then the whole culture. Now, this is my opinion, it's all confused because the macro system is reaching your child again through the media. So uh, before we used to say, it takes a village to, uh, to raise a child, right? Did you ever hear this? <laughs> now the, your, the whole world is raising your child. <laughs> so we need to think differently. Someone needs to come with a new theory on how to, to protect the child and how to uh, do something different about it. So uh, a small plan is to, okay, let's assess. And some, uh, there are some efforts for assessment I'm gonna show you. And then you put a plan, review, try it out, then assess again, and it needs to be a continuous cycle till we reach somewhere uh, better. <coughs> um, this was in the um, journal for a graduate uh, school of education of Harvard uh, College. And it really touched me because we have to, something has to be done with the curriculums. Uh, here he's calling it um, the crowded garage effect. So basically, we have a bicycle, it's old, we put it in the garage. And we're afraid to, th to throw it away or to make something new out of it. So this is how he's, he's um, explaining that this is happening with the curriculum. Why are we studying the same things people studied hundreds of years ago in the same way? So, of course, uh, there are lovely initiatives and some schools are trying, like learning to play and, and all of this, but basically the curriculum is almost the same. And there's no time for writing activities and there's no time for individual differences in the class. So, that's why a lot of children also get sent to psychologists. Because the, this, the curriculum is not of interest to them. It's not fitting with their kind of brain. They need something else. So there needs to be some kind of flexibility in the education system. And like, okay, this child has um, a lot of uh, energy and wants to move, so we provide him with this, instead of labeling him and then diagnosing him with ADHD, for example. Sometimes they're just, it's not their kind of brain, it's not their kind of, and if all our brains were the same, we would all be doctors or engineers or, you know, we 
are created to do different things, so we have to have different brains. But school is only measuring one or two types of brains, and they're the academic. So it's, it's a big uh, problem for children. This actually, I found this study like maybe 10 years ago, and I, I'm sorry I couldn't find the reference for it now, but it is, it makes sense. So in the year uh, 1900 to 1950, what you used to study at school, used to, you used to use it all your life in retirement. Okay? And then from 1970 to 1990, it only worked what you, what you learn at school will only learn, uh, work for 20 years. Okay? Uh, 2000 to 2010, they found, okay, it works for only 10 years, and then you need to relearn and learn new things in order to keep up with the with, uh, new uh, technologies and environments. And then, uh, 10 years ago, they said it, it's only for three years now. Now, after 10 years, I'm thinking maybe it's one and a half or two years after graduation. You need to learn again something new to keep up other than what you learned at school. So what, what we need to teach at school is how to learn. They call it learning to learn. We need to uh, give the children skills of learning to learn and teach them um, something called, I don't know if you've heard about it, metacognition. Metacognition is a higher level of thinking, which they uh, describe as knowing about knowing. So they have like a higher form of thinking, course problem solving, conflict resolution, all these skills are not focused on. <coughs> so the KHDA have done actually a lot of efforts uh, towards schools uh, the past five years. They have done like well-being studies. Um, with the uh, I think University of Australia, South, the government of South Australia, and they came up with a census for five years, which showed that uh, children were um, mostly okay, um, but I don't think it had the effects of the of the pandemic, right? Because I think it was announced last year. So, uh, so more needs to be done. So then it needs to be like another continuation of this. So I'm proposing some ideas about uh, how to improve schools from what I've practiced and seen the last 17 or 18 years. And one of it is there has to be some kind of daily screening. So and the teacher is the first person who can detect it. So the teacher has to be trained. So a daily screening in any form, even if it's Choose the happy face or the sad face today, and then the child will talk about it. And the school counselor, I think the teacher and the school counselor are the most important people in your child's life. They will be their, they will affect their personality, they will affect their mood, they will affect the early detection. So we really need to give attention to these two uh, jobs. Uh, this is another uh, example for a well-being framework. Children can tell, even like if it's not daily, even if it's once a week, it's important. So like how are they doing, how are they feeling? It would raise uh, a red flag when a child is stressed or when a child needs more support, and then the counselor would go and check up this child. And then the counselor would talk to the parents, and then they would refer out if needed. Uh, this is a very interesting study about the role of school counselors during the pandemic. So they took a poll with what the counselors think they were doing admin stuff, they were doing things not related to, to psychology. Um, they were given like uh, roles of supervision. And the most important thing I know from, from practical life is that counselors and teachers were like, um, like had to go into emergency mode. So if one of them wasn't well, they couldn't tell. They had to be strong. Just
just like doctors wear them and the bandana. So, so I know personally teachers and counselors who suffered uh, crucially during the pandemic and they couldn't show it or express it at their job because there was no room. Um, so this, this study shows like most of the counselors strongly disagree with where they given for, uh, clear direction, where they offer training. Where is there any kind of counselor input? Uh, again, the crucial role of the teachers. My opinion is the teacher needs to get regular teacher training, and it's not. When I see teacher training, I mostly find it's about the subject. Very rarely do I see schools teacher training about mental health or about well-being or about how to detect the red flags the red flag of uh, the, the, the children in the class. So uh, teacher training is really important. Um, they can detect a like, change of behavior in the class. They can, uh, if a child is asking to go to the clinic, they're complaining of their stomach frequently, they're complaining of headaches. It's a sign that they're asking to go to the bathroom. I'll show you really quickly, uh, this part is important, um, things teachers can see in their classes. So again, to put teachers in a place of importance for mental health. Uh, this is a child who kept all the faces out of the sand, except for one face, if you can see. The last face is in the sand and it's not breathing. And then when you ask the child questions about it, it, it cannot be noticed at the school or at the nursery when the child is playing. And then they will miss it. But if the teacher is aware, she's going to ask, what's happening here? And the teacher how to ask and not with, uh, with closed-ended questions, with open-ended questions. And then she said, OK, so maybe either this child is, uh, has a death in the family, or maybe uh, there's aggression from a certain person. So, so it's very important to see these things. Also, like if the child puts any kind of um, object or, or uh, uh, anything on their private areas, it's a red flag. It has to be like uh, referred to safeguarding and have to check what is going on. If the child is aggressive with the dogs. An uh, example of drawings, and, and teachers see drawings all the time, but they have, a lot of times they miss the things that are in the drawing. So this is a happy family. But again, any drawing of private areas is a red flag. So this child has to be referred for safeguarding. Uh, this is just a definition of red flag. I think it's important that schools, 75% of children in the states do not receive mental health services. So, so we have to uh, train children better at schools. This is, um, a play therapy area I helped uh, uh, design in one of the schools, and it really made a difference. Like children would come and express how they feel, and we trained uh, the school counselors to do it. And I think it should, it should be done in every school. PCIT is also something missing from a lot of uh, practices. So uh, parent-child interaction therapy or uh, child-teacher relation therapy where we improve the relationship with the parent and improve the relationship with the teacher in a practical way. Uh, and uh, some like, quick examples of also what teachers can see. Uh, a child put all of the characters and then put a coffin in the middle. This is completely unstructured, so we didn't say do something, we just say play, and we put the characters. Or, the, or we can say, make a story. So when a child does this, when a child does this, then uh, there's a, a very big red flag about who does that. These are our other examples, but we don't have time. Finally, this is um, my personal uh, uh, projection of what should be done. Some changes were 
Earth understanding, resiliency training, psychosocial support, CBT training for teachers and school staff, play therapy training. They don't have to be play therapists, but they need to notice the red flags. Teacher well-being training and school counselor role. Um, that's all. Again, school is it's like the whole life. It's not just education. It's your whole child's life. It's his personality. When you choose a school, you're choosing your child's life and, and his type of personality. Thank you. Thank you.